Thank you, Mr. Sabani. Let's take this discussion of Muslims and political activity to the next level. Our next talk is on Muslim cartoons and the concept of blasphemy. Dr. Ron Stockton is a professor of political science at the University of Michigan Dearborn, a research associate at the University of Michigan Center for Middle East and North African Studies, a published author, and makes frequent media appearances. He has a long-standing interest in the Arab American community and was one of two principal investigators on the Detroit Arab American Study. The university has awarded him its Distinguished Service, Service Award, its Distinguished Teaching Award, and its Distinguished Research Award. So he's very distinguished. <laughs> I, for one, am excited to hear what he has to say on Muslim cartoons. Please welcome Mr. Stockton. Someone's phone is ringing. Please uh, which put one, all your which phones on silent. How do I move this sucker? It's like an alarm. Yeah. Okay, let's go. Uh, time down. Let's get that part. Is it this? How do I advance this? Click on the mouse. Okay. Can someone show me? I'm I'm not getting a response here. Uh, I'm doing it wrong, obviously. No, it's just difficult. <laughs> so I had on the left. Okay. So here are three terms. They're very different terms. They have different meanings. And they often get confused. Apostasy means you've left your religion. That's a, that's a, a concept. Uh, heresy means you have a false belief. So if I, as a Christian, heresy exists within a, within a tradition. So if I, as a Christian, say that Jesus was a prophet, that's a heresy. If someone as a Muslim says Jesus was a prophecy, that's not a heresy, that's your teaching. If you say uh, Muhammad wrote the Quran, that's a heresy. Um, blasphemy is another concept. Um, and, and it is totally confusing, and that's the point that I want to make about this uh, lecture. Uh, fortunately, we have on record 
the first known blasphemy trial. It's in the book of Leviticus. And uh, a man is a, a man who's identified as a stranger, that is, he was an ethnic minority uh, within the Hebrew regime, is, it has, has used the name of God. Uh, you're supposed to say the Lord or something like that. You're not supposed to say Yahweh. Oops, I said it. And uh, you're not supposed to say, there's a very funny scene in, uh, in Life of Brian when someone is being stoned for saying God. But uh, anyway, uh, he, he is uh, stoned to death for saying uh, the name of God. And uh, um, it's interesting that the target, the, the person who is offended is God. The assault is on God by diminishing God to the point of saying God's name. So that's an interesting thing. What we'll see is the concept of blasphemy has evolved dramatically. So let's look at a couple things. Um, uh, this is a uh, this appeared in Britain, and here is Jesus uh, um, on the cross, but he's got glue without nails. So what is that? Satire or blasphemy? I don't know. And uh, here's another one. Um, this was during the Intifada when there were suicide bombers, and uh, someone was saying, "Stop! We've run out of virgins." And there's a third one, there are three cartoons that were together. Uh, it shows two Muslim men standing on the street with signs which say, we deserve respect and equality, and one of them whispers to the other, except of course for women and gays. Now, someone was taking, someone who's an agitator, an anti-religious agitator, was taking those three cartoons and putting them around. And he put them in the, uh, he put them in the prayer room in Liverpool, uh, in Liverpool Airport, and he was arrested, not under blasphemy, because Britain has abolished its blasphemy law, but they have an anti-social behavior ordinance, ASPO, and it's basically meant for juvenile delinquents who are pestering people. They gave this man an ASPO uh, ban for six months. He was not allowed to speak or, or, or distribute or march or anything about religion. That's a modern version. They're, they're silencing him. To me, this is just commentary. I don't know. Here's a couple of things that really irritated people. Uh, on the left is the uh, Piss Christ exhibit. Someone took his urine and put a crucifix inside of it. That's really offensive. And, and then on the uh, subway poster, in any war between the civilized man and the savage, support the civilized man, support Israel. Well, that's, a, that's pretty offensive to a lot of people. Both of these are protected under the American Constitution, and both are offensive, though. Is offensive the same as blasphemy? That's a question. Uh, here's, here's the thing that upset a lot of Jews uh, during the uh, Intifada. Uh, a, on the left, you see uh, from the Warsaw Ghetto an iconic photo of a little boy uh, being marched off to his death and a Nazi soldier uh, pointing a gun at him, and then you see an Israeli soldier uh, pointing a gun at a little boy, and I think not was. And uh, is that offensive? To Jews, that's really offensive. Uh, so here's another one. There's a group called Feminine. I think they started in Ukraine. And they protest patriarchy, particularly within the Catholic Church. And they get a lot of attention by taking off their blouses. So here they are, protesting the church. They're wearing nuns' hats. Uh, they're, uh, they're topless. They've got obscenities written and dirty words written on their chests. Uh, things called sperm, I don't know what those are. You know, the, the Pope, John Paul II, publicly apologized to women for the abuse that they had suffered at the hands of the church. Is this commentary or is this heresy? What are, I mean, blasphemy. This is certainly assaulting religion, isn't it? It's insulting religion. What is it? How do we classify it? Um, I think that the conflict between the Islamic world and the Western world has escalated very dramatically in recent decades. And there are four major crises that have uh, escalated that. The first was the hostage crisis when American uh, embassy personnel were taken, taken uh, hostage for 444 days. Some of us remember that very well. The second was the TWA hijackings. This was just as CNN was getting started, and what they discovered was, you could just put a camera on that, uh, that, that plane ended up in Beirut airport, and they discovered you could just put a plane on that and then bring people in and talk 
and you don't have to pay very much in terms of investigative reporting. And, and so uh, we got a 24-hour uh, uh, coverage of the hostage crisis. The third was September 11th, which all of us remember. And the fourth was George Bush's decision to invade, uh, invade uh, Iraq and overthrow the regime. These have escalated tensions in a dramatic and horrifying way. There are several specific uh, incidents that I think deserve mention. Um, the first was the Satanic Verses. The whole idea that you would kill a person for writing a book that you didn't like, it was just uh, beyond belief. Western, this really gave Islam a, 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 bad, uh, a bad reputation, a black eye, whatever you want to call it. Um, Risky hid for 11 years. He couldn't go out in public. He couldn't attend his children's uh, uh, school performances, things of that nature. Um, the Danish cartoons in 2006, this is the most uh, uh, well-known of them. And um, the story is that a, a Danish author had written a children's book on the origin of Islam. And he tried to get someone, he wanted to include a little picture, a drawing of someone representing Muhammad to show that uh, uh, he, he, he show him and uh, nobody would do it, do it because he said, no, we're going to do Muhammad, we're going to get in big trouble over that. So the editor of a newspaper with a circulation of about 200,000, uh, Yilin's Posta, uh, asked, uh, sent a, a letter to every single cartoonist in all of Denmark and said, if you will draw a cartoon of Muhammad, I will publish them all. I will guarantee publication. So on a certain day, they published them all on one, on one sheet uh, back in the entertainment section. It wasn't front page or anything like that. It wasn't commentary, political commentary. It was back in the entertainment section. Um, this is the most thing. Vestergaard was the person who did this. And uh, he said, she said, you know, this is not suggesting that Muhammad or Islam are terrorists. It's suggesting that Muhammad and Islam are being abused by being associated with terrorism. And so, uh, I don't think people cared all that much. Um, on the upper left, you have uh, a young boy, uh, obviously named Muhammad, and uh, that's why he's there. And he's got on his sports team's shirt, and he's writing in Arabic. He's writing in, the, in Farsi, using Arabic letters, and he says that the editors at Yilin's Post are a bunch of reactionary troublemakers or something like that. So that has to do with Muhammad, it has to do with this project of drawing Muhammad cartoons. The one on the upper right, I'm not sure why that's offensive at all. Down in the lower left, you have a deranged man with two wives, and he obviously has bought them because nobody would be want, want to be married to this guy. And uh, on the right, you have Vester uh, guy who is drawing a cartoon and looking really frightened over his shoulders, sweating as he draws the cartoon. Innocence of Muslims, this was a, uh, a movie, but nobody really thinks it was a movie. There's a 12-minute excerpt on television, I mean on YouTube. I don't know if it's still there or not. Um, um, it was about the origin of Islam. It was made by a Coptic Christian and Egyptian. Uh, this man was known for his obnoxious behavior. He was asked to leave his congregation because nobody liked him. He moved to California where there's a collection of obnoxious people and nobody <laughs> notices. And, uh, he made, a, uh, he made this cartoon, which was really, uh, it's really low quality, uh, and it's really offensive. Uh, Muhammad and Abu Bakr are said to be gay lovers, and Muhammad is said to uh, be a bastard child of his mother, and uh, it's, very, uh, it's very offensive. Um, 12 minutes, that's all. He said, and he said, he knew how to play the game, he knew how to manipulate people. He said, oh, the Jews funded this, you know, and people say, oh, the Jews, no. Uh, who knows who did any of this? Um, this was nothing until uh, Ayman Zawahiri, uh, the number two guy in uh, Al-Qaeda, called for Muslims to resist, and this led to the Benghazi attack, uh, which uh, caused Hillary Clinton a lot of troubles. The American ambassador was killed in that. Um, another incident was the issue of submission. This is another little video that was made uh, by Tail Van Gogh. And uh, if you're Dutch, you do that right, but I can't do that. But uh, Theo van Gogh and uh, Ayan Mercy Ali in the Netherlands, it had to do with Islamic abuse of women. And here's 
the, the whole thing consists of a female body, and she's got uh, violence on her back, uh, uh, domestic abuse of some kind, and passages from the Quran, which they say diminish uh, or, or mistreat women. Um, he was assassinated uh, by a, uh, a young uh, Muslim-born, Dutch-born Muslim guy. He was a positivo. He was, he was like one of those people that he is the model uh, of, of a Muslim integrated into Dutch culture. Um, I and Hersi Ali wrote her, uh, her memoir, Infidel, uh, in it. Uh, there's a passage that I have my students read. I typed it up for them, and, and it's about her circumcision, uh, mutilation, and uh, it's pretty awful. And uh, it, when I do this, I get an interesting reaction from my female Muslim students. They'll say, you know, this is really, has nothing to do with Islam. Islam provides rights for women. This is Arab backwardness. This is some kind of cultural corruption. The, the real thing, if these people were good Muslims, this kind of thing would not happen. Ayn Hirsi Ali says the exact opposite. She said, no, Islam is not the solution. Islam is the problem. And that's why she's living in the United States, unable to go back to Holland because she's under, the people who will kill her probably, or so she fears. Images of Muhammad. I took this up, I did the, delivered this on campus, and this is what we call a trigger warning. I don't like that word at all. Uh, I joke about it, but but I've got some students out there who kind of don't feel comfortable looking at some of these images, so I want them to know these are some images of Muhammad. If this upsets you, you can close your eyes for the next couple minutes. People say that uh, there are, in Islamic culture there are no images of Muhammad. It's not true. I've seen them in, in the museum in uh, Istanbul, and here are some historic ones. This is uh, Muhammad's famous night journey. He's riding on Barak. And, uh, and Gabriel is leading him uh, to, uh, to Al-Aqsa. Here is uh, Muhammad preaching. And uh, if you look at the uh, thing on the right, they're moving the black stone. And Muhammad is the one in the middle. And uh, the, uh, the university that, that has this on their website, which is where I found it, they blotted out his face. The original of his face is not blotted out. That's something they did out of perceived pressure to, uh, to not present his, his face. Um, this is so interesting. The, uh, when the Supreme Court building was built in the 1930s, uh, it's got an outer entryway and then the inner area where all the hearings take place. If you go into the entryway, along the, along the top of the, of the walls, there are, I think, 17 different lawgivers from history. Hammurabi, Moses, Salon, uh, John Marshall is one of them. And right there is Muhammad and the Quran. One of the real, one, as the Supreme Court defines it, is Sharia law is one of the great legal systems in world history, advancing civilization. When I tell my students about this, my Muslim students are so excited. They say, whoa, that is so cool. The Supreme Court is acknowledging the Quran and Sharia law as one of the great, along, along with all the other lawgivers, as one of the great legal systems in the world. But you know what? In 1997, a group called CARE, all of you know them, they're an uh, Islamic defense organization, and uh, they filed a formal protest. They wrote a letter to Chief Justice Rehnquist, and they said, this is an offense to Muslims. It should be sandblasted out of here. We will create an appropriate monument for Islam that you can put in your entryway. This is a depiction of Muhammad, which we consider sacrilegious or blasphemous. I don't know the word they used. And seeing him with a sword, it implies that Islam was spread by the sword. And I can imagine the Chief Justice rolling his eyes and saying, do I really have to respond to this? But he wrote a polite letter back to them and said, uh, this is not a depiction of Muhammad. We have no idea what he looks like. So this is not a depiction of him. It's a symbol of, of a person receiving a revelation. The sword in American law is, represents justice. It does not represent violence. And we're not trying to convert anybody. This is not... Uh, this is not what the Supreme Court does. Okay, here's a question. Who are the 
true Muslims in this case? Who gets to speak for Islam? Is it my students who say, whoa, this is so cool, I'm going to Washington this summer, and the first place I'm going is the Supreme Court? Is it, are those the real Muslims, or is it Kara who says, this is an offense? Okay, this is a question. Who gets to speak for the religion? And what you recognize when you have a blasphemy accusation or a dispute like this is that one group is claiming the exclusive right to speak for the group to the exclusion of other groups. And that seems to me to be the core of, 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 of blasphemy issues. American Muslims under attack, we have to mention this. It's not a nice subject, but there it is. This is Terry Jones. Uh, burning a Quran in 2010. He did this in Florida. People say he did it in Dearborn. He never did. But uh, he did it in Florida. Uh, but he did come to Dearborn. He's, the first time he came, he stood outside City Hall, right there on Michigan Avenue. And uh, there he was with his followers waving the American flag, the Israeli flag. The Israeli flag? What does this have to do with anything? I don't know. But there he was. And right across the street, where the demonstrators, the leaders of the Muslim and Arab community had said, look, don't go down there. Don't give this guy the time of day. You're just going to give him publicity. And they gave him publicity. They certainly did. But look, they're waving the Lebanese flag and the Palestinian flag. You know, we're well beyond the United States. This has nothing to do with the United States or Islam. This is a political struggle. You can see this. It's going in a strange direction. And uh, uh, um, there was a phalanx of officers they were going to defend Reverend Jones. Those young people, I tell you, the, the, there's an organization called BAM. Some of you know him, know them uh, uh, by any means necessary. They're a militant group. They uh, went to Fordson High School. They got a bunch of young 15 and 16 year old boys. I don't know if any of you guys were ever 15 or 16, but when I was, I was stupid. And uh, so they got a bunch of young guys, and they said, you've got to march down there and defend Islam. So, Traffic is going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, prime, prime business time. And suddenly, all these young guys come running across the street. I was standing there taking photos. I wasn't about to get in the middle of that. But those police officers, those guys were not going to make it. I've seen this before during, during Vietnam times. I knew exactly what was going to happen. The tear gas would be out, and the trenches would be out, and those guys would be lying on the ground. I knew that. Fortunately, some people in the community leaders went out and told them, go back before you get yourselves killed. Jones came back in 2012. He insisted the city of Dearborn tried several times to arrest him and to prohibit him. They lost every single time. It cost them a pile of money. And uh, finally, the court said, you've got to let the man speak. So they said, OK, you can go stand outside in the public area. You can't go on mosque property. You can stand in the public area, and you can say whatever you want to say. And I went there to listen to him, and uh, I wasn't supposed to. The police, there were 19 police cars there, and uh, they did not want anybody out there with him. But I stood with the reporters, and we all went together. It was cool. And uh, so uh, he had these signs out. Islam is of the devil. I brought that one with me. I asked him, I said, Reverend, can I take this sign? He said, sure, no problem. So I got that in my office. And uh, uh, there he is on the right. He came back once later. Um, and they went to Edsel Ford High School and stood out there. Jones is always armed, and uh, he's, he's got legal carry, he's got license to carry, and so he's, he's out there. And they said, no, you can't have, the police said, no, you can't have, you can have your stupid signs, but you can't have your weapons. Leave those behind or we'll arrest you. So they left the weapons behind. Um, Bam was out there uh, attacking anybody. On the left, you see a man and his wife who just lived in the neighborhood. It was Saturday morning. They were just taking a walk around the neighborhood. And Bam attacked them and, uh, and caused them uh, grief. And then there was an African-American woman there who was actually a young woman who was a supporter of, uh, of Jones. And Bam attacked her and knocked her down. And uh, they even desecrated a, uh, a famous professor. Um, they had been shouting, hey, hey, ho, ho, racists have to go. When they surrounded me, they started shouting, hey, hey, ho, ho, racists have to go. We stopped being plural. And I thought, you know, these people only knew one thing about me. And that's a pretty broad definition of racist. Right. Dearborn tried to silence. There's a group of people, uh, different groups came to Dearborn. I tell you, it became like a ground zero for everybody who wanted to come and do something. Um, uh, 
a group of people who were missionaries. These were legitimate missionaries. They weren't. They just wanted to pass out their brochures. And uh, at the Arab festival, there's a, a, a long canopy. It goes close to a full block. And there were uh, um, uh, tables on the side, so you could rent a table. And they said, no, we don't want to rent a table. We want to stand up. And they said, well, OK, we'll give you the table. No, you don't, we'll pay. You don't have to pay. And they said, no, we want to stand up. The reason is, if we sit there, uh, we're passing out literature. That's all we're doing. And there are some people, especially women, who will not even come over and talk to us because they don't want to be singled out. But if we're just standing there, we can pass things out. And they said, you're blocking traffic. And they said, no, we're not. We're just standing over at the side. Nobody's going to be blocked by us. Anyway, they arrested these people. Can you believe this? I wrote a letter to the mayor. I said, don't do this. But they arrested them. They lost. And they ended up paying a big penalty. People have the right to pass out literature. People have the right to do to do that which does not harm another person. Now, the Bible believers, this is a different group. They showed up. These guys were just bullies, and I don't know what they were. They were the most obnoxious people. And uh, uh, they walked around with a pig head, actually a pig head, on a, a real pig head, not a plastic one or anything. This was a real pig head. And young guys threw bottles at them and things like that. So. Uh, um, there was a bunch of uh, back and forth over that issue. Charlie Hebdo, you know this. Uh, it was named after the person who created this magazine. It's a satire magazine. Um, Hebdo means weekly, and, and this guy was a fan of Charlie Brown, so he was going to call this uh, Charlie uh, Brown Hebdo, and he just called it Charlie Hebdo. And so uh, they are they're a little bit extreme. I grew up on Mad Magazine, so that kind of stuff is normal to me. I have a high shock threshold, but Charlie had those a little high for me. And uh, they came out, they had a special issue in which Muhammad was the guest editor, and it was called Sharia Hebdo, and it said, uh, uh, a thousand lashes if you don't die laughing. And you know, that was typical Charlie Hebdo. Their office got attacked and smashed up, and uh, there you see uh, presumably Muhammad saying it's hard to be loved by idiots or something like that. And then in 2015, they reprinted the uh, Mohammed cartoons and they were subjected to a military attack. Two people obviously with combat training um, went in uh, and killed basically the top cartoonists in all of France. They killed, these are the, the, the top people in all of France wrote for them and drew for them. And uh, look at the cartoons, I think they're very interesting. The one on the left is particularly poignant because they're firing their weapons into the headquarters and they're blowing up a mosque, which I think is a, 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 an appropriate point. This looked like an Islamic attack on satire. Um, and uh, in the lower left, you see God sitting there and, and seeing all the cartoonists and he's saying, oh no, not them. So religious personalities, I think we've got to lighten up a little bit, you know. I mean, maybe our, maybe our religious founders wouldn't be quite as serious about these things as some of their, some of their followers. Um, I've got a few conclusions I want to, I want to uh, share with you. Um, uh, first, blasphemy accusations are really reflect a struggle within a community. If you're, on, if you're an outsider, if you're a Christian looking at this very often, somebody saying this is offensive to Islam, that seems like an attack on you, but it's really an attack on other Muslims. And um, regarding the uh, regarding the um, Muhammad cartoons, there was a scholar, a, a woman who wrote a, a book on this. It's a very interesting book, and she uh, was published by Yale University. And they would not include the cartoons. It's called the Muhammad cartoons. How can you? Not, they would not include the cartoons in the book. Somebody said to them, you know, you're going to all be killed if you do this. The editors will be killed, the publishers will be killed, the author will be killed. So they left the cartoons out. How can you possibly publish a book on cartoons and not include the cartoons? That's it. And so what is this? It's to an outsider. It's Muslims stifling a normal scholarly. This is not exactly a bestseller. This is an academic book, Yale University Press. Um, so, on the outside, this looks like a, a struggle of them against us. Inside, it's a struggle of them against others. 
There are Muslims who say, what the heck? Show the cartoons. And other people who say, no, that's a blasphemy. We will not allow that. Um, blasphemy laws give privileged legal authority to define in, instead of, of discourse. Um, there's always divisions. There's always divisions. Catholics, Protestants, Jews, Muslims, they fight among themselves. This very building was founded by a dissenter within the Jewish community. Um, ordinarily, that's handled by discourse. You argue among yourselves. What a blasphemy law does is empower some people to be declared the winners and others to be the losers. How many of that? Four minutes left. Look at that. This is exactly the amount of time I need. Um, and not only that, blasphemy laws give privileged uh, give the privileged group legal access. You don't have to argue, you can prosecute them. You can have them shot, you can do all sorts of things. Second, um, secondly, uh, oh, something's missing there. Um, certain groups get targeted, minority groups get targeted. In the United States, uh, in the United States, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses were targeted, particularly by blasphemy laws. They were banned, the Supreme Court banned them in 1941. I'll, I'll explain that in just a minute. Um, in, in Pakistan, the Ahmadiyya, minority groups, people without political power, are subjected to religious discrimination. Free speech empowers, okay, think about this, our First Amendment. It empowers the weak against the strong. That's the whole purpose. You can criticize the government, you can disagree with the majority. It's designed to empower the weak. Blasphemy laws empower the powerful against the weak. Yes, they revert, they reverse it. Um, who has normative standing? We've talked about that. The price of freedom, okay, here's the thing to think about. The price of freedom in a Western society or in a free society is that you have to be subjected to criticism. If you wanna, if you wanna participate in a society, you have to recognize other people are gonna, are gonna poke fun at you and do whatever they do. And so uh, that's something that has to be, uh, that has to be realized. Now, so legal and political issues, we'll go through this quickly, because I have two minutes and 20 seconds left. Um, liberal societies criminalize harm, they do not criminalize offense. If you harm someone, that's against the law. If you insult someone or upset them, that's not against the law. They just have to deal with that in a different way. The Supreme Court said in 1941, when it banned, we had one last blasphemy law on the books, and it was in, it was in Oklahoma. And uh, the Supreme Court struck down this law and said it is unenforceable because the very concept of blasphemy is a chameleon concept. You can't even tell what it is. There's no way to know as a citizen if you are violating the law or not because you can't even tell what it is. So uh, uh, interestingly, the Supreme Court struck down blasphemy in this country not based on the First Amendment, free expression, but based on due process. You can't possibly know what the offense is. Um, uh, blasphemy laws provide rights to some religious, we'll just skip over that. Um, blasphemy laws originally protected God, we saw that in the book of Leviticus. Uh, now they protect religious leaders, beliefs, those sorts of things. It's totally, it's a, it's a total reversal. From up there protecting God, it's now protecting other people from criticism or whatever it is that they don't like. Um, blasphemy laws are almost always found in corrupt countries. Pakistan, Nigeria, places like that, that's where they have blasphemy laws. And almost all the protests occur in corrupt countries. When you look at where the 220 or so people were killed uh, in, protesting the, uh, in protesting the cartoons, they were almost kill, all killed in corrupt countries that everybody knows is a corrupt country. Um, all prophets and founders were accused of blasphemy. Whoever you're talking about, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, they were all blasphemers. Because power and religion are linked together. And if you're questioning religion, you're questioning power. And they were all accused of blasphemy and subjected to great danger because of that. Finally, the organization, look at that, I got uh, two seconds left, I can, I can cheat 30 seconds. The, uh, the organization of Islamic, uh, uh, um, what's it called, the organization of Islamic, the Conference of Islamic States uh, has called for a, a universal 
content neutral blasphemy law. And they did something very clever. They took an Irish law. The Irish passed a blasphemy law. They banned anything that is, quote, grossly abusive or insulting in relation to matters held sacred by any religion. They said, why don't we just make that an international law? Grossly abusive or insulting in relation to matters held sacred by any religion. Okay, let's think about this. In the, in the, in the Talmud, the Jewish commentary on the Torah, there is a statement that Jesus was the son of the bastard son of a Roman soldier. If that law were in place, every single rabbi would have to renounce the Talmud or be subject to blasphemy laws. Uh, Muslims believe that Jesus was not a uh, uh, divine. He was just a prophet. That's blasphemy. That's blasphemy. You can just go on and on. People have, there is no way to create a blasphemy law which does not favor some over others. And if you create a universal blasphemy law such as the Irish and the Islamic States want, you're gonna open up a mess. And the Supreme Court will immediately strike it down in this country on the grounds that it, you can't even tell what the offense is. Thank you very much. startling images for many of us. Uh, but thank you, Dr. Stockton, for an important presentation, uh, informative and important presentation on this topic. Thank you, again.